I'm Alan Wardus, and this is Think Radio Presents Think Planet. My guest today is clean energy activist and advocate Steve Schechter. When the upper stream states need to meet their obligations to send so much water down to the lower basin states, the juniors to the compact are the ones they're going to have to pay. And so that's 60% of our water rights in this valley, including CBMR's uh, snowmaking water right. Welcome to another great conversation on Think Radio. Think Planet is made possible by support from the Western Colorado University School of Environment and Sustainability, empowering future change agents to foster ecologically resilient, economically sustainable, and socially just communities throughout the world. If you like Think Planet, then I know you'll enjoy the other shows in the Think Radio Presents family of podcasts. Think People, a celebration of just how amazing people can be. Think Business, a weekly discussion with entrepreneurs, innovators, and disruptors on sustainable business into the 21st century. Subscribe to Think Radio Presents on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever else you get great content. And don't forget to help us spread the word by liking our social media channels and sharing the content we post. We're grateful to have you in the conversation on Think Radio Presents. Unlike a lot of people who have awakened to the dangers posed by climate change only recently, Steve Schechter has spent much of his professional life working on real solutions to the problems of efficiency and resilience. He owns Heron Construction in central Colorado, a company that specializes in hyper-efficient building practices. Schechter has served on the boards of the Gunnison County Electric Association and the Upper Gunnison River Water Conservancy District. Both organizations are on the front lines of helping position communities for a less predictable future where energy and water are concerned. In particular, Schechter is an outspoken critic of the nation's continued reliance on coal-generated electricity in light of the urgent need to reduce carbon emissions, he says. Steve, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Well, you wrote uh, an opinion piece recently Mm -hmm. with the provocative headline, Boxed into a Dark Coal Corner. I'm fascinated by that, and I know that you've been an outspoken proponent of taking climate change seriously, taking our energy use patterns seriously, because these things are urgent. And I'd like to start with just asking you the question, boxed into a dark, cold corner, do you think that's justified? Do you do you really believe that that's where we find ourselves today? Well, I, th- I think that's a problem at Tri-State. It isn't a problem in Excel. Excel is a for-profit utility, and they have committed to 100% renewable by 2050. Tri-State has always fought. They first fought against the renewable portfolio standards. The legislature and the, the voters twice made them increase the renewable portfolio, and both times they fought it. And so finally they're at 30% renewable, but they have no plans to go any further. And that's the problem. Well, so that's sort of down at the nuts and bolts level. Mm-hmm. Various real-world organizations and their, and their positions on this issue. Really, let, let's back up and take a kind of a broad view. Let's replace the word coal with the word fossil fuels. Boxed into a dark fossil fuel corner is something that I think you would apply to society as a whole, to our oh, yeah. our entire economy. Yeah. You've spoken a lot about that very thing. Because that, that fossil fuels themselves are part of the problem. Why? Why do you believe that? Well, they're just so pervasive out there. They run our transportation sector. They run our, our residential heating sector for the most part. And, uh, and why does it matter? I mean, we've lived that way for a long time now. What's, well, at, what's at stake? Well, what's at stake is the future course of mankind when we go into a period where it's so unbelievably hot and, uh, and that heat translates into more um, vigorous storms, storms that sit over like Houston for three or four days and, and totally drown a city. 50 inches of rain in yeah, a couple of days. Yeah, just uh, amazing amounts. And then, then you just start looking at... Uh, 
you know, Colorado's climate and the climate in the Southwest and what's happening to our water supplies in the Southwest. We're, what is happening to our water supplies? Well, supply the hydrology of the Colorado River system continues to drop. And it was a system that was basically meant to generate electricity from, from the amount of hydrology we had. And 40 million people rely on that water also, not for just power, but for, you know, just the ability to have water to keep their economies going like they're used to. And, and we're finding now because of climate change that the, the Colorado River system and the hydrology of the system is, is uh, becoming very depleted. To the point where they don't even have enough water in, in some of the dams down there to meet the generation needs. Well, and so there are some people who say, well, that's happened before. Hydrology comes and goes. What, in your mind, why is today well, different? Be- because it just keeps dropping. As long as we continue to heat up the atmosphere, we're going to continue to dry out. Uh, Eric Kuhn, who used to be the head of the Colorado River District, he said heat always trumps precipitation because it can rain a little more, but if it keeps getting hotter, you're going to continue to dry out. And uh, as we continue to add more carbon to the atmosphere, we're seeing a planet that continues to heat up. Yeah, what is it? Something like 18 of the hottest years on record are in the last 20 years? Yes, yes. So that's not speculation. I mean, no, it's, is... it's just what's happening on the ground right now. And, and so, you know, we're living climate change right now in the Southwest. And how are ordinary people feeling that? I mean, I know you talk about well, the whole system, well, I, the I hydrology, would... but what does that look like to uh, the average person living in the West here? Well, you know, if you're a rancher, you know, that's uh, – we're talking about maybe losing 60% of your water rights to the Colorado Compact because their water rights are junior to the Compact. And when when the upper stream states need to meet their obligations to send so much water down to the lower basin states, the juniors to the Compact are the ones they're going to have to pay. And so that's 60% of our water rights in this valley, including... CBMR's uh, snowmaking water right. Mm-hmm. And so you're talking about an agreement that was made back at the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah, 1922. Between upper basin states, Colorado, mm-hmm. Wyoming, Utah, New Mexico, and all of those downriver yeah, um, Arizona, user states Nevada, and California. California. And even Mexico. Mm-hmm. That requires a certain amount of water to flow down the river. Mm-hmm. And so what you're saying is because of climate change, the that amount of water is unavailable is, uh, anymore. Well, unavailable. I mean, it's functioning today, right? But barely. Barely. I mean, it's it's in its last gasp. The Colorado River Commission's really worried. They've been meeting, and of course, I'm not really up on exactly what they're talking about, but they're trying to get the upper basin states to deliver enough down there that we don't lose the, the hydropower and, and we're able to, you know, not negate the agreement between the upper states and the lower states by mm-hmm. not delivering enough water. Mm-hmm. But the trouble is the when the compact was negotiated, they used inflated numbers. I mean, at the time, they used the uh, 1920 or 1921, which were flush years as the amount of water that was in that river. And, <laughs> and turned then, out that way. No, it's never turned out that way. And we've gotten along up till now, but because of climate change, I mean, everybody's worried. So if I'm living in the upper basin somewhere, like we are, mm-hmm. um, and I'm not a rancher, what does this matter to me? Well, it's, it's going to matter at some point. Like the city of Gunnison gets 40% of its power from WAPA, which is the Western Area Power Administration that gets the, the electricity from the Bureau of Reclamation, cash register dams, and then, mm-hmm. and then distributes the energy. And so the, the city of Gunnison has a, a sizable WAPA allotment, and mm-hmm. it's very cheap power, two and a half cents a, a this is kilowatt hour. Yeah, mm-hmm. hydropower. But the, the fact of the matter is they're in danger of losing a lot of that hydro. And, and apparently from my talks with some, some other people, um, WAPA also owns some coal-fired power to make up for when there's years when they, they don't have enough power. So the city's crows about, you know, that 40 percent of their allotment is green. Well, depending on the day, it mm-hmm. might not be very green. 
Well, or very secure is what you're saying. Or very secure, yeah. yeah. In a future – so this is all based on the idea that the trends that we're seeing in hydrology today are going to continue. Mm -hmm. If they don't, if we get 10 nice wet years, then we stave off this disaster right, for a while. Right. But what does the science tell us about the likelihood of that? Well, it's until we do something about the amount of carbon in the air, we're, we're going to continue to see a planet that heats up more and more every year. So, mm -hmm. you know, we really need to change our ways and actually even start pulling carbon from the atmosphere because apparently we've set the course right now for the next 10,000 years. Where we are right now, we can do all, all we want to do about climate change, you know, mm -hmm. change our ways, but that carbon's up there for 10,000 years. It doesn't just go away quickly. So it's something that either we're going to have to – we're going to have to stop using as much carbon, and mm -hmm. then at the same time we're possibly even going to have to find ways to pull the carbon out of the atmosphere and sequester it. So, so recently the, um, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued yet another report. They, mm -hmm. they come out pretty frequently these days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and there was some alarming language in there. Actually, for the first time, placing a time benchmark, mm -hmm. they said we have about 12 years, 12 years if we hope to avoid what? If we hope to to hold um, warming down to an acceptable level, right. which is, right. I think, 1.5 degrees centigrade. Yep, yep. What does that mean, first of all? <laughs> Again, for the average person out here, what does that mean, 12 years? Because... Climate change isn't a cliff we're driving off of. It's it's a slope we're sliding down. Yeah, would yep, you agree with yeah. that? Oh, I would agree with so, that. So so what's the point of saying twelve years? What what does that do? Well, I I think because of forty years of foot dragging on climate change, it it means that we've gotten basically to the point where we need to totally change our economy from a high carbon economy to a low carbon economy, and we need to do it quickly. It's the only chance we have that we're going to actually change things on the ground by, mm -hmm. by doing that. Okay, and so when you say we, we need to change the I'm, amount I'm of carbon. I'm talking everybody on the planet. And how does that work? What does that look like to the average person? Well, it depends on where you are on the planet. I mean, some places, they're already migrating out of the area they live in because it, it's too dry. There's no water resources left. There's many places on the planet when there's no water resources left. It's too hot to grow crops. You can get so hot that plants won't even pollinate. The flowers come out. They desiccate right away. Mm -hmm. That's that's happened. You I'm know, thinking of Australia. Oh, yeah. In the news recently. Is well, you know, we, temperatures. and we've had that in the Midwest where we had some days where they were so blasted hot that the corn crop couldn't pollinate because the tassels would just dry up. Mm. The hairs on the top of the corn would desiccate and dry up, and they couldn't, they couldn't be pollinated. Mm. Well, what can we do about that? I mean, that's the heart of my question. Okay, let, let's say for a moment that overnight a miracle occurs and everybody on the planet is on the same sheet of music. We got to do something. Mm -hmm. What? Well, just transition to renewables, renewable energy. Get away from coal. Stop driving cars. You know that are internal combustion engine that uh, burn fossil fuels very inefficiently. We need to change how we heat our homes. Transition away from fossil fuels in our homes. And all of this is going to cost a lot of money. No doubt about it. We got a, our transportation system to get skiers to the ski area. It's, you know, high carbon air travel, which is double the cost in carbon of ground transportation. And so, you know, on multiple levels, we need to change how we do everything. And that means transitioning to renewable power, heating and powering our homes off of renewable power, and converting our transportation system where it's running off renewable power. All these things are possible, and, and the technology's here now, but it's just trying to get people to adopt these technologies and invest in these technologies because it really is an investment not only in your personal life, but it needs to be an investment for our whole society. Mm -hmm. So if I'm, I own a home or maybe I'm renting and I've got a, an agreeable landlord, what are the things that I could do right now today 
well, that don't cost thirty thousand dollars. I've mm-hmm. got to start somewhere. Right. Well, most most homes are very leaky just because of leaky windows, and and uh, you can you can now call even the city and get have them do a uh, an energy audit on your house to find out where the problems are, and so you're able to start at the low hanging fruit and work your way up to mm-hmm. the to solutions that you know make your home more tight. Hopefully, it may, may be a little more insulated and keep your your carbon use down. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the beginning step. And beyond the audit, there's money available from, oh, yeah. from a yeah, variety of sources to help yeah. you actually fix yeah, what you find. Right. And, and they do come in and help low-income people all the time. But they also, you know, it's kind of on a sliding scale. I mean, there's some people that actually get LEAP assistance mm-hmm. where they, they come in and work on your home because a lot of times it's, it's cheaper in the long run to help somebody, even in a rental, you know, tighten that house up to mm-hmm. where your energy bills are less. And so that means in the long run, LEAP's not having to subsidize your energy bill every month. But then you start getting into rental units that... Uh, the landlord really doesn't care about those things, and then that's a real problem. And well, that comes back to something that you just said, that the technology is here, the processes are available for the most part. Mm-hmm. The challenge is getting people to agree and get on board with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's did, a lot of education is involved. In, well, do you see any trends today that are giving you cause for hope that maybe that sort of psychological barrier is being broken? People well, you know, last willing. last night at my house we had the Green New Deal house party at my house and and 30 people showed up to uh voice their concerns and mostly it was voiced about what's happening just right here in town. And those same things are happening in towns all over. Oh, right? oh they are. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Cuz that's what needs to happen. We just need to start having, you know, more awareness and and try to wake people up that this is going on around them and that uh, everyone needs to be a part of the solution, not just your next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. Everyone needs to be part of the solution. What happens if we don't get there? What happens if 12 or 15 or 20 or whatever the number of years might be? I mean, that's a little bit of a soft target, honestly. Well, I think it's just going to more and more start to affect our economy. As the cost of your insurance goes up because you're having to pay for that hurricane victim down in Florida or 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 Texas or or wildfire or whatever, that raises everybody's uh, insurance prices. And uh, Well, cost of food. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Could go up. Oh, yeah. In fact, let's talk a little bit about food production. Yeah. Um, You've already mentioned corn. Yeah. Yeah. I know you've studied this issue. Oh, yeah. What does the science say about our ability to continue producing food at levels that we've come to rely on? Well, you know, our crops were all developed in cooler times. A lot of our major crops, corn, soybeans, and these these other things, they're used to having a certain climate to grow in. And they aren't, they haven't really come up with a bunch of drought-tolerant and heat-tolerant plants to replace the ones that are in the mainstream right now. And when, when it gets hotter and drier than what these crops can handle, then they just don't produce like they should. And as, as we get into further and further heating, we're going to see a lot of crops that just cannot handle the heat, and even farm workers that won't be able to handle the heat. Apparently down in Central America now, a lot of the agricultural workers are subjected to such high temperatures they can't even hydrate themselves fast enough to keep their bodies cool and mm. and and so there's real physiological problems caused by working in in too hot a temperatures and so all of that's coming online too where you can't go out and hoe the soybeans like you did before mm. so and so what is your answer to those people who say well wait a minute there's still enough uncertainty in the research and in the science, even what you've been talking about, that those are sort of anecdotal examples, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. regional and localized. Right. What's your answer to people who, who don't quite buy it yet? Yeah, the science is there. You know, predominant number of the climate scientists say it's happening, mm-hmm. and there's only a few, few from industry that are paid to say that it's not happening. And the industry, the fossil fuel industry, is the, is the most prosperous industry on the planet. 
and uh, they're able to afford to buy buy the media to confuse people on climate change. So, but it's there. All you have to do is open your eyes. I see it. You know, since I've lived here 40 years, I've s- seen the changes in in our climate here locally. Well, and as I as I say, that's happening in towns. Yeah, all over, all, the place. all over the place. You know, if you don't happen to live here, um, yeah, it's it's chances some, are. Yeah, but they're you know, and we've been breaking uh, heat records year after year after year. We break the coldest temperature records once in a while, but heat higher heat temperatures almost everywhere keep continuing to go up. Record temperatures continue to go up in towns across America mm-hmm. and around the world. Why do you think it's so hard to overcome this inertia? that we seem to have between, okay, I can see it. I I see that the wildfires have increased in size and severity and so forth. I I see that the hurricanes are are more severe. Why is it so hard to get to that next step of, okay, well, that means I have to do something? Well, I, I think humans have a hard time dealing with a threat that's off in the future. Mm. And, you know, if it's immediate and right here, you know, it's fight or flight. You know, that's that's how humans for hundreds of thousands of years have, have survived. Right. It, the immediate threat, you deal with the immediate threat. But if the, the threat's way off in the future, you have to plan to deal with it. And humans are not really good at planning anything. And I think that's part of the problem. You know, like my wife and I years ago decided that we didn't want to live in the country anymore and we needed to be in town. So, we, you know, way ahead of time, we bought a lot in town and then we planned for eventually to move into town. And so we've always invested our money in, in the lowest cost things. You know, we always, you know, before we buy a vehicle, we read consumer reports. Mm-hmm. Most people just walk into a car <laughs> lot and just buy whatever the the salesman tries to get them to buy. Mm -hmm. And so that's the problem we've got, number one. That's why SUV and pickup truck sales are in the majority of the auto purchases in this country. Even still. Yeah, Mm -hmm. even still. But we always bought the most reliable car. And then when we started building a home, we built a a solar home because we wanted, you know, the solar to pay part of the energy bill. Passive solar works really well. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then eventually we, when we moved into town, we built a house that we knew would take us into the future, which basically, you know, it produces mm-hmm. more energy than it consumes. And then we hadn't bought a car in 13 years. We, the car had over a quarter million miles on it, and we replaced it with an electric car. I mean, you've just got to start planning ahead. Mm-hmm. And that's what we've always done, planned ahead. And that's the problem with most people. They live in the now. Yeah, and so what you're talking about really is um, a it's, fundamental change in how we think. Yeah, and that's really the problem that the human race has. You know, either we're going to have to change how we think about things, or we're not going to survive as a species. So we can't just tinker around the edges and no, change no. this or that. No, there's too many of us now. There's you know seven and a half billion humans on this planet, and they all want the same thing which is a better life, which usually means starting to burn, use a lot of energy. Well, because that means consumer goods and experiences like travel. Oh, yeah. And the human race has got to the point where with population and and energy consumption where they need to start thinking in the future. How do we make that transition? I mean, I don't know. That seems actually a whole lot harder than just the idea of reducing carbon. Do you do you have anything you could point to that you would say, we're getting started over here. Maybe it's a little change, but we're getting started. Well, I I think you know you're starting to see it in the younger generation. This push for the the green new deal that's coming from the younger generation. Mm-hmm. Of course, we had our party last night, and almost everybody that showed up there was over thirty five. <laughs> yeah, and so. The Green New Deal people were really not able to, even with all their social media and everything, whip up an, an, enough interest in the young, younger generation to even call me up and ask to come to my party. You know, I had it in both newspapers, the shopper. Mm. I, I advertised little on Facebook, but I don't know where the younger generation is these days because, you know, we got nobody well, under 30 but, at our party. But you just contradicted yourself. You said you're starting to see it among the young yeah, people. Yeah, well, I am, and especially up here, you know, at the university, the ones that are, 
that are you know getting their masters of environmental uh, management and and the environmental studies students are seeing it but it's it's just like me trying to teach my neighbors that maybe they should look you know hang on to that car a few more years Mm -hmm. until they have a little more money and then buy an electric car because it's really much cheaper to own an electric car than Mm -hmm. it is to own a internal combustion engine car you know decisions like that yeah and and yeah it's you're going to have to have a whole population that's much more aware of what's going on around them yeah and not just in in the now right now you know and that's let me ask you just a we're almost out of time but i want to i want to end on this note you know a lot you've studied a lot you see a lot in the world around you Um, you've served on water boards looking deeply at things like, uh, you know, the Colorado River Basin in distress. You've served on electric co-op boards where you can see this relationship between renewables and fossil fuels and so forth. Knowing everything that you know, how do you keep your head up? How do you keep you from going crazy uh, with, it's, it's with difficult fear and time. pessimism? But what, what are your techniques for doing that? Well, I, I, I see that if, if some people can do it, it's possible to get other people to do it. And uh, so, yeah, I, I always have hope that humans will, will uh, become more aware and, and more of them will become more aware. And, and hopefully that will get us to where we need to go. So I, I try to be optimistic on, the, on that count. But I, every day you see pessimistic numbers out there to say, tell you that uh, things aren't really going all that well. I mean, you just have to look at carbon carbon uh, output around the planet, CO2 output around the planet, and we continue to go up. And so it, it doesn't look good out there. But then there's a few places, a few countries like Denmark, where they're almost 100% renewable. Because so they, have, be they have a government and people that are willing to go there and see the need to go there. Mm-hmm. And don't have all the obstructors we have in this country. We have a hu- huge amount of people whose financial interest is to stay in, in carbon forever. And they have enough money to, to buy up senators and congressmen and, and, and sway public opinion that we need to continue with fossil fuel production. But these other examples you raise offer at least a glimmer of, a hope. Glimmer of hope that it is possible. And, and, you, and even like Kit Carson uh, Electric Cooperative down in Taos, New Mexico, they left Tri-State and, and all their, all their uh, outside energy comes from renewable, renewables. Guzman Energy, an energy aggregator, gives them 24-7 uh, renewable power while they're pay, also paying off the, the debt to Tri-State, Guzman is, and then when, the, when it's paid off in another four years, Kit Carson's going to have 40% lower retail rates because of, uh, yeah, because they're, they're going to be totally renewable, including they're, they're building a huge amount of local solar. So, so, okay. so there are good examples out there of people that, you know, once, once they get out from heavy-handed thumbs on top of them are able to move forward and, and, and really show us the future. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's cooperatives like Kit Carson that keep me, you know, very positive on where we could go. Well, and individual people that, yeah. that are tightening their homes, that yeah. are buying electric cars and so mm-hmm. forth. Yeah. Steve, thanks for joining me today. Great conversation. Yeah, I hope, I hope I've been helpful. <laughs> thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for another great conversation on Think Radio Presents Think Planet.